Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, back, I hope. Or if you're a new person who's here particularly to see Mike Masnick, a big new welcome. Um, this is DWeb Decoded. Uh, I'm Danny O'Brien. I work for the Filecoin Foundation. And what we do here is we look at the movers and the shakers of the decentralized web. That's to say the reinvention or re reinvention in some ways of the web to work in a more decentralized way that provides more autonomy and more uh, options for users, developers, and uh, and creators. I'm here with someone who I like to think I, I share an origin story with. So <laughs> Mike, Mas Mike Masnick is um, the founder, writer, and editor of TechDirt. It's an amazing um, resource for understanding what's really going on in the tech space. Um, there's a great uh, uh, profile of you in the New York Times, which I think can probably explain all of that um, in a little bit more detail. But I just want to say we go back a long way. Do you want to explain this or, or yeah, shall I? I mean, right? I was going to say, like, I, I don't know if, the, if if we come from the same origin, except I, it's that I ripped you off. I mean, <laughs> is, the, is the truth? No, no, no. <laughs> like, you know, we have a very, we have a very freewheeling view of copyright <laughs> and it was great. So, so TechDirt started off, I mean, still is really this very incisive, regular, kind of it's not skeptical but it's like it, it, you know it's kind of how would you describe tech that then i mean i guess yeah i mean it's i think it's it's always been it's been this weird mix of of optimism but skepticism of the stories that people are telling right so right. I'm, I'm optimistic about technology and innovation and and, and the power that it creates and what it enables among people but I'm, I'm skeptical of the stories that some people tell um about it and so it's right. it, it there's a there's a balance in there somewhere yeah i think that i think so to clear the air for people just going wait <laughs> is there some tension so i also <laughs> i also briefly did um a sort of newsletter which had that that same kind of tone and yeah there were more stories. So I did a thing called Need to Know uh, out of the UK. And, um, you know, one of the things when, you, if, if any of you out there have like started a Substack or a Mirror XYZ, I'm trying to like, you know, throw in yes. the, the D-Web versions of this, um, you know, you sit there going, God, is there going to be enough stories? You know, what am I going to write about? <laughs> and at that particular point, which it must have been 1997, you could sit right. and it was like, I mean, to use the one that I think we both probably ripped off, which was suck.com with right. an S. Uh, their um, their uh, catchphrase was a, 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 a fish, a barrel, and a smoking gun. Yes. Right? And that's what it was like. You know, there was so much hype, but people writing the stories didn't really understand the tech and were often being sold a bill of goods. Yes. Um, and at the same time, there were these amazing things going on that I think it was relative, it wasn't that you could see happening, like juggernauts yes. coming down, right? Like the music industry or the yes. news industry were going to be really affected by these things. And um, of course, everything's changed now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, what do you think? So... It, this but, thing hold, hold on, hold on one second. Let me just finish the the the, the story, yeah. which is that you had need to know, and and which was this newsletter, which was fantastic, and and I believe Thank the you. archives are still are still up there. They so are you can still In glorious them. HTTP. Yes, and right. and somebody had forwarded me uh, an email copy of that just at the time when I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And I read need to know. <laughs> and, and I thought this, this is it. This is brilliant. The format, the style, the tone, the, the sort of sarcasm, everything about it was exactly what I wanted to do though. I knew I couldn't do it nearly as well as you could, but <laughs> I decided to just copy it. And so I, I started writing what well, before, the sort of proto tech dirt was we called it up to date, which was just again a total oh, ripoff of that's need to right, know. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and and I and, and it looked the same and it it you know it was <laughs> it was my very weak attempt to, at, at copying you. And I wrote it for I wrote 
the first, like, I think it was three or four issues before somebody forwarded it on to you. And then you emailed me and this was our first contact. And I still remember this where you said, uh, I, I can't remember everything that you said, but the the one line that stuck with me was that the only IP that we believe in is internet protocol. So we're <laughs> absolutely thrilled that you're doing this. <laughs> Phew. I was like, what would my younger self? I remember, I remember like getting into a hilarious mock fight with Joshua. I hope I mean, this is all interesting to people like that. Um, but with Joshua Schachter, who wrote, yeah. um, who built um, uh, Delicious, yes, uh, which is six revolutions back. But Delicious was the thing that was basically one of the very first kind of Web 2.0 sales. He sold it to um, to Yahoo. Yes, R.I.P. Therefore, <laughs> it just disappeared. Um, uh, but he had a thing called meme pool and that yes. was the that was one of the sections and and like the thing again the thing about and we see it now right is that you know you can't you don't really think of these things in terms of oh i've come up with this brilliant idea and no one else has it right, right. everybody starts thinking in the same direction at the same time and yeah. then and then you're just like oh we're riding a wave now this is this is interesting so and, and wrenching us back into the 21st century. Um, I mean, you're kind of riding a wave right now, um, Mike. Like, for the last couple of years, you've gone from sort of this steady drumbeat of description about what's going on to, I think, kind of being like the social media expert, right? Or one of them. <laughs> Do you feel expert now? Oh gosh. Um, that's a, that's an odd question. I'm not even sure exactly how to answer it. I mean, some of it is just like, you know, if you've been around for too long, you know, you, 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 I, I've seen enough things come and go that, that maybe I'm able to put stuff into perspective more, but also I feel like to some extent, you know, what the last, you know, really two and a half decades has done and, and, you know, leading into the last like five or six years to maybe the last decade even has really stress tested a bunch of, you know, ideas. You know, when I started yeah. writing all this stuff, I sort of had this view of the world and how, you know, all of the things that we were talking about originally about the, the optimism of the internet and, and how it was empowering people and all of the benefits of it that I, I believed in and thought w w were really important. And then of course, you know, the internet has changed a lot in the last few years. And, and so there was a lot of kind of like thinking through how, you know, do, do my principles still hold? Do the ideals right. that I thought we were empowering, is, is, is that, is that real? Is that, did that happen? Did I make a mistake? Were, were my assumptions off? Where, where did things go wrong? Yeah, this is the this is the converse, internal conversation I describe as are we the baddies, right? <laughs> right, right. Where from the sketch where like yes. there's a bunch, we've had a bunch of like not SS um, I blank on the comedians, but they're sort of going yes. have skulls on our caps, and I'm going, <laughs> you know, I felt really strongly that information should be free and everyone should get to talk to one another. Oh, was that as good an idea as we thought? <laughs> so how did you, how did you evolve? How did your opinions evolve? I, I mean, I, I think I feel that, you know, and, and, and sometimes I wonder if, if every, if this is just sort of like cognitive dissonance, like everybody sort of, you know, has to justify their own positions. And so no matter what they say, they're always going to say, so I, I, I do feel that, you know, um, I, I still feel very strongly about those things in general. I still feel right. like conceptually that access to information and freedom of speech and the empowering aspects of the internet are really, really important. I think that there were some mistakes and problems along the way. <laughs> mistakes uh, were made. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I think that has, and and I understand why those mistakes were made. And I don't think that there was like, you know, there is this, people want to believe that there was some sort of like nefariousness or, or evil force behind some of these things. I think right. they're all sort of like natural, there's like a natural evolution of things. Right. Um, and there are incentives and, as well, yes. right? Like you sit people, oh, yeah. 
I spend a lot of time talking to people in the D web space and some, some, some genuinely feel right. Well, we'll make this work because we're not bad. Right. <laughs> right? Like, all we need to do is to try and do the same things as, you know, Mike, uh, Mark Zuckerberg or, or whatever we'll do, but we'll do it. And it, and we won't be bad. And right. you're sort of going like Google. Yeah. I, I, I won't mean, speak for Facebook, off with that. right? <laughs> yeah. But like Google, I say this to people and they really are, they really are surprised. Like, all the people that you would expect to be kind of, um, uh, you know, people who've had ethics at the heart of uh, why they were doing technology. Most of them were in support of a lot of what Google did. And then there's just this question about when did it turn? Right. Um, rather than, oh, yeah, like big tech has always been um, uh, kind of in the grips of VC or, or, or whatever the kind of Manichaean version of yeah. this is. Yeah. Um, so, and I think like part of the reason why looking in, you ended up being the person that people came to to analyze what was happening in social media, especially in the last couple of years, was just like social media feels. I mean, it feels like the hot spot where you can kind of tease this apart, right? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a few different things there. One is that, you know, a lot of the earlier years, sort of like mid 2000s, 2010 through 2012, 13 or so, you know, I spent a lot of time really focused um, on, on copyright related battles. Right. And what's interesting to me, to some extent, is how the battles over social media are this sort of echo of the copyright battles. You know, you can see sort of variations on it. It's not exactly the same, but but there there are things and elements of those same kinds of battles. Um, and like, like, like what? Like what? What are you thinking? Like Section uh, Two Hundred and Thirty. I mean, some of it there's there's Section Two Hundred and Thirty, which has some some you know there's like. DMCA equivalents, but, but more like to a larger extent, this idea of that to some extent that the, the, the internet is changing things and changing the industries that, you know, have been around for a long time and have been really, really important. And there are interests at play that, you know, there, there are, you have this mix, right? So you have. So you just sounded like you were going to you were going to go very QAnon there and go there are <laughs> no, players no, no, no. behind the scenes, but, but <laughs> no, yeah, there no, are people. No. There are winners and losers, right? Yeah, and so 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 where I was going actually is is not not QAnon, but but uh, you know towards this this view that you have some people who um, for their own economic interests are trying to cling to a world of the past, right? So you have certain industries that say like, you know, this internet is going to undermine our existing business model and the way that we do things. And certainly that was that was evident in the in the copyright battles of the of the earlier parts of the 2000s um and this sort of complete freak out there. And then you had um people who they convinced that there was like this underlying moral argument there, you know, we're fighting for the rights of the artists or whatever. And mm -hmm. so I'm seeing some of that in the discussions and the debates around Section 230 and about social media, where you do have like some legacy industries, and some of that includes like traditional media, um, who, who think like, you know, this is problematic and this is undermining sort of our ability to, to be the kind of gatekeeper of truth or whatever. And, and and so they have this sort of generally negative view of the internet, and then you have people who, you know, are convinced that 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 social media just in general is just a bad thing, and 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 they have certain points that they can make that are legitimate, just as like you could make legitimate points in the copyright battle about you know if there is uh you know all piracy then then how do artists make money and and right. there are 
there there are ways, but it it changes things. And so you, now you have the same thing where there are legitimate complaints about, you know, if the world is full of disinformation, how do you know who to trust? And and how do you handle that sort of thing? And and when people are sucked into believing all sorts of disinformation, this is the anti QAnon speech. Then then you know certainly it can lead to to bad and and potentially dangerous situations. And so there are legitimate concerns mixed with with just sort of like you know effectively moral panics and so right. and and then you see sort of politicians and lobbyists get involved and you know separating out like who is doing this for legitimate reasons versus who is just doing this to protect uh, a sort of you know do d- uh, decrepit business model you know is is a little bit harder to sort out and so right. And, and, you know, and you can point out like, oh, people are only doing this because of the business model. And it's like, well, there are some people where that's true. And then there are some people who are, who honestly believe that these things are just inherently problematic and they can point to examples of like real harm. Right. But then there are people who, who, you know, refuse to recognize like the many good things that are coming out of the internet as well. And then how do you balance those things? And And I sort of come at this from a world of like, like, yeah, like let's recognize all of this. And then like if you can actually separate out the fact that there are good things and bad things happening here, and then you can start to get into the sort of deeper, more thoughtful nuance of like how do we yeah. how do we increase the good stuff and, and try and limit the bad stuff in in a more practical way that isn't that doesn't have the sort of knock on effects of limiting the good stuff too. I think it's this funny there's this funny dynamic and I mean again, like I it's sort of it's I, I say this just because I have a sort of similar path in the, if you write in this particular direction, right. Where you're going, the story here is more complicated yeah. and like, you need to understand all of the context. And in the nineties, a lot of that context was that there was a generation growing up who understood the internet and then there were people coming right. into it. Didn't it's not, not the case now, right? Like everybody has an opinion on, right. uh, on it. Right. <laughs> But um, you sort of get to this point where you've written about, I mean, you, you write a lot. You write like every <laughs> freaking day. Yes. And um, uh, what, what happens after a while is like you're, you're sort of a journalist, but you're also going, okay, where are the solutions, right? Like yeah. where are the, like, I, for me, you can, you can imagine people's motivations all the time, right? And like after a while, you just go, I'm not sure like knowing the motivations is particularly useful. The real question is out of this menu of things that people are saying, what is going to work, right? Like banning right. the internet isn't going to work, right? Like I, as you were talking about this and sort of the interaction between copyright and social media now, I had, I, I, I was, I mean, you've been writing about it for years, but the, the thing that's happening right now in Canada, um, yeah. for those of you looking from the future, so Canada <laughs> just passed this thing which requires social media sites, and you can correct me on the details because thank God I don't have to pay attention to all of these <laughs> things every day. Um, uh, but basically, if you, if those sites link to or describe the news, those companies have to pay the news companies. Right. And maybe you can point out what is <laughs> ridiculously wrong. With that. I, I mean, there's so many different things. And, and, and this, this actually, you know, goes back um, quite a ways in that, you know, somewhere around like 2015, it may have been even a little earlier than that. There started to be, it's, it originally started with there, there was a speech that, that, the then head of News Corp uh, made about how evil it was that these successful internet companies were um, stealing from from the news companies, stealing um, the facts. Yeah, right. which right, you know, facts. I mean, whatever. We yeah. go deep on that. Like, you know, facts are facts, right? They're, you can't copyright facts. Um, and you know, and then Rupert Murdoch gave a speech, and he wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. And it was all, and it, you know, like, I found it ridiculous and fascinating for like Rupert Murdoch, who goes around claiming to be a, a free market, you know, believer and, and supporter and all this stuff. And he was basically arguing for what is effectively, you know, pure corporate welfare in terms of like 
these internet companies, namely Google and Facebook, um, are very successful. And News Corp is not as successful, though still, you know, making billions right. of dollars. Uh, and therefore, like the government should force Facebook and Google to just give us money because they're they're stealing from us and linking to us. Um, and it was just a very, very weird argument and yet seems to have caught on in some places. There's this belief that because some people, instead of buying a newspaper and instead of, you know, getting news directly from the source, they're going to Facebook, seeing what people are posting or following different news sources and seeing what comes up in their feed and then maybe clicking through and maybe not or going to Google News and seeing a news feed that's presented there and then maybe clicking through or maybe not, that this is somehow stealing from them. So mm -hmm. this is just a bizarre theory in all sorts of ways. The idea that linking to a new, like, you could you could make an argument if they were copying whole articles and not linking that that, that raises other issues. This is a link. This is not a, what they're doing, right? A this headline, is... a snippet, a, an image, and then sending traffic. And like, you know, I, I know from personal experience that like if your stories appear on Google News, like it sends a lot of traffic. You get a lot of traffic, and. We also know that like those news organizations like that traffic and want that traffic and they hire search engine uh, optimizers to, you know, seek out that traffic. But now they're asking to also be paid for that traffic. And so the, the very idea behind it is that to link to someone, you would fir you first need to pay them to send them traffic, which is like. You know, I, I think back to the, the days of, of uh, again, going back to sort of the copyright music space of like payola and, and radio, where, right. you know, the record labels would, would pay DJs to play their music and, and to make hit songs. And, it, you right. know, and, and, you know, every few years there would be some sort of like legal crackdown on it and they would come up with some new scheme that was effectively the exact same thing, whereas you were paying to get music. Here, what the news, news organizations led by Murdoch are effectively arguing is that there should be reverse payola. Like you should be forced to, to promote our stuff and pay us for playing, <laughs> playing, it, you know, for so, promoting it. So the thing that I, and I think this is, again, this sort of insight that you, you have, right. Um, is first of all, you sort of go, well, this isn't going to work, right. If right. you need a subsidy for your new service, then you're not changing the new service by just, forcing someone to pay but but you know if to a certain extent this wealth redistribution between sideways wealth redistribution right. <laughs> is a little like well i just get guess there's these, these monopolies up there but the thing you worry about is that stuff like this can have a knock-on effect to what oh, yeah. i think actually could solve this problem right so yeah. the thing i keep repeatedly saying to people is great now these companies, these powerful media companies have a vested interest in keeping this yes. business model going because yes. that's their income now, right? Like those are the, yes. the, those are their customers. And I think this brings us, wrenches us back to like the D-Web, right? And the decentralized web, because of course, if there's a law that says you have to pay someone to link to them, um, you know, there are usually cutoff points where it says, okay, you have to be as Mark Zuckerberg, you have to be right. as big as this. But the principle is established. Yes. And that means that if someone is built, you know, on Mastodon, if Mastodon gets popular yes. or Blue Sky gets popular, um, suddenly you have to pay individually to, I don't know, point to things. Right. And, right. Yeah, I mean, the whole concept of it just completely breaks with the concept of the open web. Right, right. Because in the open web, you can link to anyone that you want. You don't need permission. You don't need, you, you don't need to pay to link to someone. And so once you've established that that, that principle is okay, you have all of these knock-on effects. And, and certainly the ones that you mentioned, you know, for one, it's like, will the news organizations still cover, you know, I mean, you know, the first, the first like law, I mean, there, there were a few different attempts, you know, uh, 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 Belgium passed a law along these lines, Spain passed a law along these lines, but the ones that everybody points to is the one in Australia from a few years ago, um, 
where it was written almost they almost basically wrote in the law like this applies to facebook and google and no one else which is right. you know questionable in its own way right uh, but but you know then you have this question of like will the news organizations in australia that are now you know heavily reliant on money from google and facebook will they cover those companies critically anymore because if they're able to 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 write about them in a way that that you know, sinks those companies and, and lowers their value. Or just objectively, right? Yeah. Like, I think, you know, it's suddenly another factor in it. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, absolutely. And then, but then you have the, the other question, which is what you also brought up, which is like other, other sites as, as sites are up and coming. What you're really doing in setting up this system is almost locking in those those larger companies. Because again, like, you know, Will the news organizations be afraid if something like Mastodon becomes more and more popular? I mean, right now that's confusing because in theory it, it might become more popular because of Facebook, because of threads, but that's, <laughs> that's like a whole, whole right, other right. issue. But, but, you know, like, will they, you know, one, will they then advocate for that? Like Mastodon has to pay. And then if that, you know, because it's, it's a, you know, federated system, how would that even work? You know, but but also like will they try and talk down Mastodon because that might hurt their income stream from Facebook, right. um, you know? And, and then the other part of it is that you've just now that you've established that like what's to stop it from that model from just being about news? I mean, you could see lots of other industries saying that you know, well these these more successful, more innovative companies need to pay us, you know, right. and so. You, you know, who know? I mean, to some extent, you know, some of the music and 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 TV and movie industries have effectively done that with YouTube, where they, you know, really sort of force them into into cutting deals or whatever. Um, but you could you could see that anyone else in, in sort of a legacy industry that just says the internet is taking away from my business and therefore these internet companies have to pay us um, for linking to us. And, I, and and it just becomes a fight over who has better lobbyists. Right. And I think it's all in those situations, it has to be, it's the only, it's the, a deal that you can only really cut if you're in a quasi monopolistic yes. situation, right? Like and, it's one big industry negotiating yes. with another big industry. Yes. And, 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 and related to that, I don't mean to cut you off, but like, no, no, no. The, the, the related to that is that, to some extent, the government likes that as well because it it gives them more control, right? Right. You know, they're setting up the rules for this. Um, you know, all of these the 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 like the Canadian bill and the Australian bill are all written in such ridiculous language because they're just saying all we're doing is forcing people to the negotiating table. But there's like you know a gun to their head, which is that if they can't negotiate a deal, then it goes right. to like some sort of arbitrator who's just going to pick how much money has to be transferred from one giant monopolist to another giant monopolist. Um, and, you know, and, and just that, that setup, I mean, you know, at the same time that this is happening just in the news space, you know, like literally as we're speaking, uh, you know, the, the, the DSA in, in Europe is, is going into effect. Um, and that's another one where you look at the law and there are some, some thoughtful bits in there and some parts that are good, but there are lots of parts of, of the DSA that are built under the belief that the structure of the internet that we have today, which is mainly a few giant, giant companies, um, which, you know, in, in the, the terminology of the, the DSA or the, the VLOPs, the very large, uh, uh, God, what, how am I blanking on what the, the O is? <laughs> Uh, very large organized... something providers online okay. online online, online. providers right, right yeah very large online I remember providers. them calling them gatekeepers for a while and so, I was like so yeah, that's that's pretty that's the other one that's but, the, yeah. the 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 DMA which is the the Digital oh, right. Markets Act they still refer to them as gatekeepers so that has a has a categorization of gatekeepers the DSA which is Digital Services Act has this VLOPs which um, a friend of mine refers to like a, like in the princess bride of uh, rodents of unusual size <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> these these companies that are very large that that ha have all these rules associated with them but if you look at the sort of the setup of the DSA it's built on this belief that there couldn't be small independent players right and, right and 
and that you know you couldn't there's no concept of like decent really decentralized providers in this space and how they have to act and there are you know there are uh, obviously somewhat different requirements for the VLOPs versus other providers. And they have like different tiers of stuff, but there are a lot of conditions that apply to anyone who is hosting any third party speech, which means your federated, uh, you know, uh, Mastodon instances that, you know, if they have like 10 people or whatever, you still have all of these requirements that no one could meet. Like, right. you know, and, and it's, it's almost funny to me because like, at the same time, the EU has been kind of encouraging, like things like Mastodon, and they like the they you know, have they, a Mastodon instance. They right? have their There's own Mastodon EU. instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I fully expect that it will not comply with the DSA requirements in the same way that like both the EU Commission and the EU Parliament both were hit with uh, claims of violating the GDPR when that came right. into effect. I, I'm fully expecting that the the EU's Mastodon instance is not going to comply with the DSA, um, and. And yet, but like, there's this worldview that, that, you know, the internet is such a dynamic thing that is so constantly changing. And obviously, you know, you and I know, and, and, and watching this, that yes, you know, the internet trended towards this world, which was dominated by a few very large players, but there are still many of us who remember that it wasn't always that way and it doesn't have to be that way. And we're seeing all of these attempts from many people, some of whom grew up with it like we did. And some of whom just sort of, you know, are, are finding out now that they can, they can build a, a, you know, a world that isn't controlled by those large players. And yet all of the regulations are built around this idea that the world could never go back to that. And, and, and that, that seems very problematic. So I think one of the best, I think, one of the things that 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 succeeded in kind of re-explaining how this could happen, how it used to happen, and what the difference between what we have now and what we could have was um, was protocols, not platforms, right? Which is a yeah. paper you wrote, I guess, two thousand and I don't know, a few years ago now. It, is, um, it came out in 2019. Yeah. Right. I, I mostly right. wrote it in 2018, but it came out in 2019. Right. And I think it brought together a lot of threads that you've 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 talked about on Tech Dirt. Um and of course in the decentralized D Web world, you know, people people from IPFS and Filecoin to um, you know, all of these other systems. I'm not saying that to privilege our stuff, I'm just there's so many <laughs> Nostra and at and yeah. uh, Veiled, which is the DEF CON produced one now. Anyway, they're all protocols, right? That's the yes. thing that I have to re explain every time. Um so assuming our audience kind of gets that, right? We don't yeah. have to tell them that. Like I think in that kind of, yes, but will this work kind of discussion, <laughs> I think there's some really interesting critiques of that. And the one that, of course, sticks in my mind is Moxie Marlinspike. Of course, um, yes. Uh, pseudonymous uh, um, author of, uh, founder of Signal of Whisper Systems. Yes. Um, Signal, actually, weirdly for the fact that, you know, open source free software hippies and, and people we all like it right actually yeah. kind of restricted right moxie would use a lot of um charisma to kind of disincline people to build new clients for it and yeah. he gave a great speech a kind of going actually open development of protocols doesn't uh, you know i have some problems with that which is why i'm doing it myself yeah um in this more closed way, do you, are you, now you've sort of established the terminology and the kind of, um, uh, the outlook, have, have you been kind of, not in an, are you, are we the baddies, but like you know, the, <laughs> the kind of like, is this going to work? Is this sufficient to bypass what we have now? Yeah. I mean, I, I it, it's, it's made me think a lot and, and, um, I've had a lot of discussions with people and in particular sort of like the, the the moxie argument about it. And I actually just recently gave a talk for the this uh the summer of protocols program that I don't know if you're familiar with that, um, where I talked about 
sort of my evolution of thinking on on protocols. Um, and I brought up the the protocols, not platforms, paper, and then I brought up you know some of the criticisms of it and some of the the issues I've had, in fact, with the way that people have interpreted my paper, which I. I think we're wrong, <laughs> which I'll, I'll, I'll take on, on me. Like I didn't explain right. myself clearly enough if people are misinterpreting parts of it. Um, but like, and so it's, it's evolved or it's, it's definitely evolved my thinking, but also kind of crystallized my thinking in terms of, of how I understand this. And it actually, a lot of that thinking went into the paper that, that, that I wrote for, for you guys, um, uh, more recently, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead here, but like, no, but, no, 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 this is going to be a big reveal, right? Like, yeah. um, uh, uh, but yeah, but, um, where I'm sort of mentally building out a framework and recognizing that, you know, when you're talking about incentives and structure, that it helps to have kind of a framework for what things make sense to have in a protocol and what things it makes sense to not have, to be built on the protocol is, is basically right. the way I think about it. And so, you know, I start to, I started to think about like the difference between like things that are centralized and things that are decentralized and, and, and people get into these debates and it, it, there's like this idea that like, Oh, you know, decentralized or, or, you know, systems are just inherently a good thing and centralized systems are inherently a bad thing. And I don't think that's true because obviously like centralized systems have some key advantages, right? They're, they're definitely, uh, you know, you have, you know, they can be more efficient. They can, uh, you know, provide a better user experience. Historically, it doesn't have to be the case, but you know, certainly that, that is often what has happened. Um, and so, you know, to some extent you have this, the, the kind of like benevolent dictator situation where it's like, you know, in an ideal world, you would have this sort of like widespread democracy and everything would come together and, and through experimentation, sort of the better things come about. And, and I tend to believe that, but occasionally you can have a benevolent dictator come along and just build a better thing. The problem with that is that, you know, the benevolent dictator is not always benevolent <laughs> and right. that they might not always have the right idea. So I as, tend to believe. As, yeah. As we said, right. You, you yeah. set up something in some ways, Google was a benevolent dictator, right? Yes. It created this search engine and everybody went, wow, I can find things on the internet. Like this is great. And yes. then it starts becoming this other thing and you're going, wait, yes. the search is not working as well, but right. you're doing quite well. So yeah, anyway, carry on. And, and, and you, you no longer have control over it, right? You know, right. The, 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 the more messy decentralized distributed systems, you know, are slower to get where they need to go, but, but when things go bad, they can correct for it. And again, sort of in, in theory. And so, you know, a lot of what my thinking is now, and, and that actually is sort of some of, moxie's argument right so you know his his argument against protocols is what he refers to as like the the ecosystem is moving and so part of what he is saying is that when you have an ecosystem that is not settled and is constantly changing and is in a very dynamic world a protocol system is too slow to react Mm -hmm. That if you need sort of constant innovation on a particular level, then there are problems because with a protocol, you need sort of consensus of some kind, a committee that is working on it, and you don't have the sort of big breakthroughs. And and there's truth to that. I mean, you can look at certainly plenty of standards bodies and processes and, and you know, multi-stakeholder processes and, like, all this stuff that, like, Some they that move we've slow. been in, right? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. They, they move slow. And so, you know, my where my thinking is, is evolving now is, like, understanding what things make sense to be more centralized and what things make more sense to be decentralized. And, in fact... The, the sort of breakthrough realization that I had, which I don't know if is a real breakthrough or just for, for me and like my way of thinking was that to some extent for all the talk of like protocols being like the basis for decentralized systems, to me, I sort of realized like the protocol itself is centralized, 
the protocol is like this agreed upon centralized system on which yeah. we can then build a decentralized system. And so right. my thinking is that, you know, where the protocol matters and where it makes sense is you say where we don't, we no longer really need like dynamic, rapidly changing systems. Those don't make sense in the protocol. The protocol should be the thing that, that everyone sort of agrees on. This is the base. This is the, the foundation. This is where everyone sort of agrees. We need this sort of centralized protocol system that everyone agrees to. And then you can go build your distributed systems on top of that. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, I don't think I'm disagreeing with, with Moxie. I'm just, you know, looking Trying at to separate which, them. which parts, which parts should be a protocol, which parts should be decentralized. And I don't know if I fully agree that like, you know, uh, that, that you couldn't build signal in that way. Like I think the, the sort of core underlying aspects of what goes into signal could certainly be a protocol that then anyone else could build on. So, you know, I do have some criticisms of, of where he's going, yeah, but like, yeah. Yeah, but, but, and but, it has, but, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, WhatsApp uses it. I, I'm yes. playing around with Beeper, which is yes, this so very I, interesting, I which, absolutely which is, love Beeper. Yeah. which is just for those who know, is like a, a thing, a, a commercial offering um, that kind of brings together all your messaging systems. So it has yes. to act like a, a signal client. So yes. it's kind of... You know, I mean, Moxie's moved on, but it's sort of like, okay, I'm I'm going to break this this rule, this yes. sort of um, thing. Yeah, interesting. And so, and so yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I should I feel obliged to mention because we 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 primed it that that yeah we actually grabbed you to edit um, a collection of these extended yes. thoughts because we were like, oh, people are still thinking, and yet people haven't. Um, uh, brought together uh, more thinking. It's going to be called, I think, the D Web Digest. Um, I'm not sure when it's shipping. It's soon, and it'll be exciting, yes. and people should look out for it and follow um, the Falcoin accounts uh, everywhere they they have it. The Falcoin Foundation accounts, but um, but yeah, there's a great piece by by you. There's a piece by me, um, and there's, there's a piece a, by. I, some, I, I, a fantastic piece by you, by the way, which which I have been telling many people to look out for when it comes out. Because I kind of feel like we have to. We already <laughs> should do a second edition because, again, like people ask you to crystallize these things, and then you write it, and then it yeah. starts you thinking about the next thing. Yeah, um, and I think um, I think it's good that that that. that we it's a work in progress, right? Yes. It's fascinating talking to you about like centralization and decentralized because during the day job right now, um, the Falcoin network is actually going through like a set of decisions about this. And one of the questions is that the people are arguing about is like, to what degree should this be decentralized? And right. of course, part of the challenge is how do we decide? <laughs> right. Like, do we decide in a centralized way? Do we, de how do we, you know, who decides how the decision process should happen? And, um, uh, I won't, again, I won't spoil anything. You'll, you'll see some posts if you're interested in our, uh, our own ecosystem. Right. But it's definitely something, I mean, you see it with, um, activity pub yes. and, and, you know, people are trying to work out. So, I mean, if we could talk for hours, but we only have one. Um, <laughs> I guess the my my we should talk about like the predictions of what's happening um, yeah. now. So we're now sufficiently out of the Elon apocalypse of Twitter, which definitely made people look at decentralized solutions, and yeah. you were pretty you were a pretty key commentator and analyzer of that. Um, <laughs> How do you think it's playing out? Like, where do you think, what are, where do you think we're going at this point? It seems like a little bit of a, I wouldn't say ceasefire. Again, for those of you in the future, <laughs> Donald Trump just did his first tweet yesterday um, of his mugshot. So is that going to turn Twitter into, I don't know. I, you're the yeah, <laughs> it's, it's good gosh. Uh <laughs> I try not to predict the future very much, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, so 
I'm going to go backwards a little bit to get to where I think things are going and sort of what I'm thinking about now, which is that, so in the years after I wrote the Protocols Not Platforms paper, I would hear from people probably once or twice a month saying, hey, I'm building exactly what you said. Um, right. And it was just like over and over again. And many of them were not, you know, <laughs> uh, and some of them that were didn't have any path to getting any users. And so, you know, there's this, the, you know, one of the arguments that I kept going through with people was like, well, well, how do you get users? And I sort of, you know, I saw two potential paths to that and neither of which were all that appealing. Um, one was that a big company would recognize that this actually made their own lives easier, um, even though it was giving up control, a significant amount of control. But, you know, I, you know, sort of, I was hoping they would recognize that they were getting beat up uh, repeatedly by governments and media and everyone all around the world because of that control. And if they were able right. to give up some of that control, it might actually ease their lives. Which um, I think is like blues really kind yes. of people go, <clears throat> people ask me, why is Jack Dorsey doing Blue Sky when he yes. has Twitter is going, because running Twitter is a nightmare. And like yes. running Blue Sky means that people will be able to do this and he wouldn't have to like be hated right. by everyone. But he, he found his own solution to that by finding yes. someone else who would they would hate more. Um, yeah, anyway, yes. sorry, Car carry on. No, no, but that's exactly it, right? So like part of the, the Protocols Not, Not Platforms paper was was really an attempt to convince the large companies to to do that and to invest in that. And and it worked in the case of Jack Dorsey, right? I mean, he he cited that paper as one of the one of the reasons why he decided to to go forward with with Blue Sky. And I'd had conversations with other companies as well because I figured those companies could bring the users and that solves the sort of user situation. The other example was that somebody built something that was just inherently better in some fundamental way. You you're mm -hmm. not going to bring the users just by creating the same thing uh, unless some sort of cataclysmic situation happens with one of the existing players, or you have to build something that is just inherently better. And so I was at a conference at Columbia University um, in October of 2022, so a year ago, effectively. Um, and there was somebody giving a presentation which very nicely cited my paper um, saying like, you know, believing in decentralized systems and protocols over platforms. And they had this chart that I can only describe as sort of the, the underpants gnome chart of of this question which you know this the sort of south park reference of like steel underpants uh question step mark two, question mark question mark question mark step three profit you know right. the, the question marks are important and so they had this chart that was basically like you know centralized systems up here decentralized systems beneath it and there's a line there is an event that causes people on the centralized systems to drop off and the people on the, the decentralized systems to rise up. And I raise my hand, I'm in the audience and they're citing my paper, which again, very nice. And I just said, that question mark, you know, <laughs> what, what, what is, what? what is that catalyzing event? <laughs> like, that's the big question. That's everything. You can't just say like, there is some catalyzing event that day, that very day at that conference, you know, it wasn't during that session, but I I can't remember. I think it was right yeah. after that session was the announcement that Elon Musk was was you know ending the lawsuit and actually going to buy Twitter. And so suddenly everybody at the conference was talking about that. I didn't realize that was the catalyzing event. Right. Like right. that that single event, you know, has just completely in in many ways rejuvenated the idea of more decentralized systems. And yes, like. Twitter or X or whatever I, I refer to it as X Twitter because that that seems to make that, the most sense correct. to me. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, it's still going and it will be a going concern for a very very long time. And I you know and it might you know muddle along, but a lot of people have have left and a lot of people are exploring new ideas. And so you had like a massive growth on Mastodon, which may have leveled off, but uh, you know every every so often you, you get these hits. You have Blue Sky, um, which, you know, is sort of a very more controlled growth, but is growing and, and has a lot of excitement. You have a couple other platforms as well. 
And then you have sort of meta and threads, which I'm not exactly sure where you fit that into the ecosystem. Because, right, because big, 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 I mean, it's meta's yes. Twitter play, but it's also going to be using, they say, um, ActivityPub, which is the yes. standard that underlies, underlies Mastodon, yes. right? So, yeah. Yeah, and and there are people who insist they'll never actually make the connection, and there are a lot of complications with them actually, you know, connecting to to the rest of the Fediverse and the Activity Pub world. But they really do seem committed to it, and they've said so publicly multiple times. I've had conversations with people at Meta who insist that they absolutely are going to do it. It is a, an important part of the roadmap to for them, and. I, I think that's actually really noteworthy and important because if if we can get those larger companies to recognize that giving up some of the control and allowing there to be decentralized systems where people can communicate with people on your platform without having them be in your silo and locked up and not having access to all their data, that's a, that's a, a really good and important step forward. And so right now we're in that sort of, you know, fuzzy period where who knows who's going to win and lots of people can make predictions about this is going to win or this is going to make the most sense but the thing that's exciting to me and really encouraging to me is that we're getting the experimentation which you know including the users which wasn't happening certainly not at the scale that was necessary to make a difference beforehand and now suddenly like people are actively looking for alternatives and they're open to new ideas and they're open to new approaches. And so that excites me. And they're, they're, I think that they're kind of voting with their feet rather yes. than kind of just having to make do with what things are like, no, you know, you go into different places and people are going, Oh, I don't like this about this. Right. And you're going, okay, this is interesting because clearly like you know, there's some flexibility here, right? Like each group yes. is going, oh, well, maybe we will need to do this because, yeah. And, and um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's, it's really fascinating where you have these discussions and you have, you know, and, and, and you'd mentioned Noster before too, which I'll, I'll throw in uh, also is like a really interesting platform that I think has some limitations, but is, has been really fun to watch, at least in my case, sort of seeing how, how people are using it and, and sort of the development that's going on there, but also like, you know, Mastodon in particular had very clear and made some very clear decisions early on about what they would allow and what they wouldn't allow. And you could understand the reasoning behind them. But also, I think a lot of that frustrated users and, and people. And now they're sort of recognizing like, oh, maybe we made some some mistakes in our early days in terms of you know, not allowing quote tweets or or the effective you know equivalent, um, you know, limiting search. Again, there are like there were reasons for that, but people are recognizing like maybe that limited growth. Yeah, and so it's like yeah, yeah, and, and so I I I love the the experimentation phase that we're in now, and it again sort of harkens back to kind of you know earlier times where you didn't have these like you know single sources that you would you would have to be locked into and who knows how it shakes out because these things always you know you have winners and losers over time but we're seeing the experimentation and the the challenges and so it's it's like to me it's kind of the most dynamic aspect of of the social media era where we're seeing different experiments and and you get and, th and that's where you learn what works and you learn the most interesting interesting things and i'm hopeful that what comes out of that will be something that is a more decentralized protocolized world in which the users have more control and we're not you know we're not at the whims of of one person or one crazy billionaire and uh and plenty to write about in yes, periods yes. like this, thank you. So, um, <laughs> too much, Masnick, too much to write about. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Mike Masnick. Um, uh, you probably already follow and subscribe to Mike's um, uh, work and his uh, his colleagues at Tekta. If you don't, you absolutely should, and you should uh, follow and subscribe. His also his uh, excellent pack podcast. Is that still being supported by Patreon? Are you yeah, still? Yeah. yeah okay. So, and, so the the podcast has a Patreon. Yep. Um, yep. And and Join we have that. and 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 TechDirt has a full full text RSS feed. We we've had that from from Woo. basically the beginning of RSS, and so feel free to subscribe to that. And 
and and and TechDirt itself, we we have very few, if any, advertisements. We don't bombard people with advertisements because yeah. they annoy people, including ourselves. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah. So you know, there was no right and wrong. There was just people who <laughs> learned from their mistakes. I think is the yes. most benevolent way to describe it. And. Um, <laughs> Uh, I hope you learned from our mistakes and um, <laughs> and, and Mike's uh, good guidance. Uh, follow and subscribe to this podcast um, on whatever medium you'd like. And uh, follow the Falcon Foundation and the Falcon Foundation for the Decentralized Web for more about what's going on in our ecosystem and a little bit about what's happening in the ecosystems we're next to. Um, see you next time. Thank you. Thanks.